How about we pray and then we'll get into our sermon this morning. Lord, we just thank you so much that we don't have to earn salvation. That you're the God who made a way and we will proclaim for eternity how great thou art. And we'll get to experience that. We'll get to see you. We'll be with you in heaven and we will get to proclaim that and enjoy the eternity and the bliss that goes with that. And so we thank you for that, Lord. And while we're on this earth, Lord, we, we, there's so much joy, but there's also so much struggle. There's good times and there's hard times, and we just pray, Lord, that you would give us wisdom to be able to navigate both and stay your faithful people. And as we get into your word this morning, we just pray to open up our hearts and minds to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week, we, looked, we started to look at the beginning of chapter 4. And we saw how Dinah went out into the world and she got raped by Shechem, the son of Havah the Hivite. And we looked at the fact that the world is a dangerous place, particularly for women. And we, we focused on the fact that our world is trying to forget something which is obviously true and should not be forgotten. But men and women are different. And this should influence how we structure and think about the way we live in this world. But it was not just Dinah who was in trouble in this chapter. In fact, God's whole people are in danger in various different ways. So what I want us to do is we're going to jump back into chapter 4 and we're going to look at chapters 34 and 35 this morning. And we're going to see what we can learn from Moses. I think it's important to note here, I think as Christians, we've become a little bit too comfortable, a little bit too at ease in Zion, you could say, because we've had it so good for so long. I mean, we, we live in the Aussie laid back, let it be kind of culture, don't we? Where the days are very simple and, and, and there's not a lot of opposition in a lot of ways. In fact, we probably have it better than most people have throughout history. Indeed, there's probably only a couple of places in Europe and maybe in the US where people even have it as good, at us, as, good as us. And I don't think there are any places where they have it better. But this is changing. And more and more Christians are waking up to the fact that this is changing. Our culture is going in a terrible direction. And we need to change our posture towards our culture to prepare ourselves for what may be coming. See, the term culture wars has often been seen as a battle between the political left and the political right. And at the moment, the left is ascendant. It's so ascendant that the right-wing party pushes left-wing policies because it's the only way they think they can get elected. But there is a much bigger culture war outside of politics that we really need to focus on because it's the more important culture war and it is this. It is the battle between seeing God's culture enacted in this world and the world's culture enacted in this world. So this is part of why God leaves his church on earth because he wants us to enact his culture, to bear forth his kingdom. So we get some insight into how to fight this battle in this passage because in this passage we see that God's people face many threats. So let's see what we have to learn. And the first threat that we see that faces them is the danger of assimilation. Now assimilation is a big threat to God's people all throughout the Old and New Testament. It's one of the biggest threats. It's talked about constantly throughout the Old and New Testament. We see it in many different ways. But it seems to be something that a lot of modern Christians have forgotten about and aren't really that concerned about. But let's look what happens in the rest of this chapter. And we're going to look at the rest of chapter 4, and it's fascinating, as we read last week. So chapter, Genesis 34, we'll start with verses 5 to 12. And I'm reading from the ESV. Now Jacob heard that he, that is Shechem, had defiled his daughter Dinah. But his sons were with livestock in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came. And Hamar, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. The sons of Jacob had come in from the field as soon as they heard of it. And the men were indignant and very angry because he had done an outrageous thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter. For such a thing must not be done. But Hamar spoke with them saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him to be his wife. Make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. You shall dwell with us and the land shall be open to you and dwell, dwell and trade in it and get property in it. 
Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, Let me find favor in your eyes, and whatever you say to me, I will give. Ask for me a great bride price, and gift as you will, and I'll give you whatever you say of me. Only give me the young woman to be my wife. So last week we focused on the danger that was posed to Dinah by Shechem, but there is also a greater danger in this passage, the danger of assimilation. In verse 9 it says this, remember, make wives, make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. You shall dwell with us and the land shall be open to you. Dwell and trade in it and get property in it. In other words, Havor, the king of Shechem, or the leader, or, sorry, Hamor, the king of Shechem, is offering something very similar to Jacob and his family that was likely offered to Lot earlier on in the book of Genesis. Remember what Lot did? Lot placed his tents towards Sodom. In other words, he became, he became part of the city of the Sodomites. And we saw how that turned out, didn't we? <laughs> that was a fascinating passage. But Jacob is being offered the chance to marry in the land and to be able to do commerce in it. It seems to always come down to a choice about money, doesn't it? Almost always. Money is involved in this, this corruption in some way. And this passage seems to imply that Jacob, Israel, did not know what he should do. But his sons, they conceived of a plan. Verses 13 to 17. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully. Because he had defied their sister Dinah, they said to them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we agree with you, that you will become as we are by every male among you being circumcised. Then we will give you our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters to ourselves, and we will dwell with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and we will be gone. First thing I note here is how much these sons are just like the father. They answered Hamor deceitfully. <laughs> the fruit is not fallen far from the tree. In fact, we see, we will see as we go on, that basically this whole family were a bunch of heel grabbers, incredibly deceitful. But God will teach them. They will learn the hard way not to live that way. But they, why do they set up this ruse? And they set it up as a trap so that they can destroy the city. They place them in a vulnerable position. Verses 25 and 20 to 29. On the third day, when they were sore, so all the men in the city circumcised themselves exactly, and all the men in the room just winced, just thinking about it. And on the third day, when they were sore, and that's what that verse literally means, you don't need to explain it anymore. Two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. They killed Hamar and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys and whatever was in the city in the field. All their wealth, all their little ones and their wives, all that was in their houses, they captured and plundered. Now Jacob's two sons do what many brothers and many fathers have wanted to do throughout history go on a violent rampage and desperately hurt the people who harmed their sister. In fact, in a lot of ways, this passage is taken. It's just like the movie Taken. Have you seen Taken? Yeah. Where his, his daughter gets taken, as the movie says, and he goes to rescue and he kills every single person that touched her in the movie. It's a, uh, it's a famous action movie. The only difference between this passage and Taken is that this Genesis passage is probably just a little bit more brutal. Now, the commentaries are incredibly harsh on these two brothers, Simeon and Levi. But I want you to consider this. There is no police in this day. They don't have any other authority to go to. There's, there's no one king of this whole area. Each little city had its own king, and the king of this city was in on it. Hamor had no intention of punishing his son. In fact, he wanted to multiply the sin by saying, look, make her his wife. They're also likely outnumbered. There was probably more people in the city than in Jacob's tribe. And they are desperate to save their sister, who has been seized by a genuine psychopath who wants to molest her and then marry her. And their whole family is at threat, so they come up with an ingenious plan <laughs> to disable all the men in the city. And that's what it does. The men can't fight while they're healing from this incision. 
But they also went too far, didn't they? Indeed, Jacob believes so because he curses them in Genesis 49. He says this, and I love how the King James puts it. This is Genesis chapter 49, verse 5 to 7, the King James Version. Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly, mine honor. Be not thou united, for in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-well they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Now it's interesting because this curse is actually fulfilled in the Old Testament. Simeon, which is placed amongst the, the, the tribes of Judah, basically disappears into the tribes of Judah over the course of the history of Israel. And the Levites were scattered amongst the people of Israel with no inheritance in the land, although they were blessed to be the priests of God. So while we see Simeon and Levi go too far in their cruelty in punishing the Hivites, I mean, a response was needed. They just went a little bit above and beyond. But it's interesting. God still achieves his purposes in protecting God's people from assimilation through their actions. And this will be a theme that we continue to see throughout the rest of the book of Genesis. God using human evil intentions to achieve great good. In fact, that's the conclusion of Genesis. You will see that when we get up to chapter 15, we see that famous thing which Jacob says to his brothers. But we should also learn from the brothers as well. We should learn because they did not want their people to assimilate. And they were commanded by God not to assimilate with the people of the land. And we should also learn to be militant about not assimilating. But we should not go so far in our, in our anger against the pagan world that we also sin. And by militant, I do not mean use violence as they did. I mean we need to be confrontational about not assimilating to the pagan culture that we live in. We can no longer afford to be lackadaisical about this because the church has lost a lot of ground in this area. Let me ask you this question. What has been the strategy for the last 30 years of the church trying to reach the world? The strategy has literally been, let's look more and more like the culture. And how has that worked out? It hasn't. It's worked out terribly. See, when the church looks like the culture, it loses its whole reason for existence. And that is why our enemy is so keen to make sure that we do assimilate. Because when we do, we lose our effectiveness. When salt loses its saltiness, it's good for nothing. Remember Jesus said that? We need to think more and more about how we can be different to our culture rather than how we can be assimilated. That we shouldn't be trying to sanctify wicked pagan science just so we can be accepted by intellectuals. No more bowing down to the, the corrupt sexuality of the world so that we don't offend. We shouldn't be trying to base our priorities around the world's priorities, but rather around God's, because light only stands out in a dark place. <laughs> and that's what we're supposed to be, a light in a dark place. And we won't stand out if we look just like the dark place around us. Now, that's not the only danger that Israel's people face in this passage. They also face the danger of destruction. In fact, total and complete annihilation. And that picture is a picture of churches being demolished in, in, a church being demolished in China. So verse, chapter 34, verse 30 to 31. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have brought trouble on me by making me a stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? I love that last line. That's like the Clint Eastwood line. Jacob is right, though. He is outnumbered. The inhabitants of the land are many more than he is. And we know from other parts of the Bible that there are giants among the people of the land, the Nephilim, the descendants of the fallen angels. Now we know that Jacob is not the confrontational type, don't we? In fact, he often just runs from trouble, whether it was Esau or, or whatever it was. In fact, his failure to confront Hamor and Shechem is probably why his sons went to the level of brutality that they did. They're probably frustrated at their father's inaction. 
And he feared being wiped out by the people of the land. So how did he deal with this? How did he deal with his fear of being wiped out by the people of the land? Well, he did it the only way that he knew how. And that was he turned to God. Genesis 35 verse 3, Then let us rise and go up to Bethel, so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. Jacob learnt to lean on God. Who helped Jacob when he was in danger from Esau and then again from Laban and then again from Esau? God. God helped him. In the midst of his enemies, he trusted in God because God had consistently come through for him and protected him. Just as Jacob feared destruction, so too do many Aussie Christians. Many Aussie Christians fear that God is going to allow the Australian church to be wiped out. That it is too late. That Christianity is on the decline. Indeed, even if you look at some of the fastest growing churches in the country, they're not really presenting a true Christianity. There. They're more, more often than not presenting a watered down American style prosperity gospel rather than the actual message of the truth. So even some of the signs of growth are not that encouraging. But why would we be defeatist? Is not our God the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Is not our God the God who said he will build his church as a promise? Is not our God the God who turned the whole Roman world upside down with 12 Jewish disciples? <laughs> the whole Roman world, the mightiest empire the world had ever seen at that stage. Jesus said this, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And what is the rock upon which God is going to build his church? Well, it's verse 16. Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That rock is the proclamation of who the Messiah is. Jesus is the Messiah. We are his people, his Israel, and he will build his church. And that is exactly what he did, and it's exactly what he's been doing for 2,000 years. You know, God's work of making a people for himself, that's what our whole series has been called, Building God's Family, began with guys like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he is still continuing it to this day. Why would we think that God cannot do great things in our culture today through the church? I can point to many times in history where the church was in a much more desperate situation, and yet God turned it around. We have an amazing God. You know, I personally think we need to stop fear being persecuted and give the world a reason to persecute us by being bold with the gospel and taking it wherever we go. The devil doesn't have to worry about persecuting lukewarm Christians because by staying silent we do his job for him. The most dangerous threat that Jacob's people faced in this passage though came from within. And it was the danger of idolatry. Verses 35, chapter 35, verse 1 to 4. God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who are with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel so that I may make them an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that they had and the rings that were in their ears. Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree that was near Shechem. I want you to think about all the amazing things that God has done for Jacob up until this point. All the incredible ways that he has prospered him, that he has rescued him, that he's protected him. All the incredible things. And it's not until this point, this point in his life, so, uh, that he actually says to his family, put away your false gods. He hadn't said it yet. He says it now. Isn't that fascinating? And it's crazy to think about because there is only one thing which could have actually destroyed Jacob's legacy completely. And that was if he had turned away and followed after false gods and rejected the Lord. And this is interesting, isn't it? Because Israel, we see this throughout the whole Testament, they struggled with putting away their false gods. They were tempted to keep them around, revitalize their worship them, and they were constantly tempted to, to bow down before the fertility cults and the, and the sex cults of the pagan world. 
And just as God's people in the Old Testament were tempted to commit idolatry and chase after false gods, so too are we. We face the same danger. We spoke about this a few weeks ago. We looked at the fact of the foolishness of following after false gods. We looked at how Moses mocks the gods of Rachel because she's able to sit on them. They can't speak out for themselves. We looked at that. And if you want to look at it again, if you missed that message, go back. It's on Facebook. You can look at it. We can see the foolishness of chasing after false gods. But I just want to say one thing here. Do you think the devil, who managed to deceive the Israelites into worshipping the gods of Moloch and Baal, Baal, has stopped doing this today? Do you think he's stopped trying to deceive God's people? Of course not. He roars like a lion looking for people to devour. And one of the most potent tools he has is to get us to chase after false gods. We need to put him behind us. And the last danger I see in this passage that Jacob's family faced is that of wicked sons. Genesis 35, verse 22. While Israel lived in that land, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. And Israel heard of it. We already saw how Simeon and Levi responded. And, and even though a response was needed, to Shechem and Hamel. They went too far in their response. They were too cruel, and Jacob criticizes that later in his life. But now we see that, that his eldest son, Reuben, is also quite wicked because he goes and has sex with his father's wife. And if you read Genesis verse 40, it'll, it'll mention that Bilhar is one of his wives. A concubine was effectively a lower status wife in this culture. Do you remember what Paul said about this? In 1 Corinthians 5 verse 1, it is actually reported that there is a sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans for a man has his father's wife. So this was a level of sin which was so wicked, it was something even the pagans would often look down upon as disgusting. And it's the very sin that Reuben committed. He took his father's wife, which is exactly what Paul is referencing in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 1. Somebody in the Corinthian church had done something similar. And this is important to understand that God's people are only ever one generation away from complete apostasy. It only takes one generation to turn away from the Lord. If you read the book of Judges, that's what we see constantly through the book of Judges, the book of Kings, <laughs> the book of Chronicles. It is an ever-present threat before God's people in fact, God is aware of that, and hence he's going to teach Jacob's sons a lesson in the hard school of humility, which is what the rest of the book of Genesis is about, and we're going to look at that. But God was aware of that and is going to teach them. But we should be careful to never forget this. We too have a responsibility to make sure that the, the values of the Christian faith are passed on to the next generation. You know, too, too often throughout Christian history, entire generations have been lost because their parents failed to pass it on to the next generation. Why do you think there are so many distractions in our culture which take us away from doing what we're supposed to be doing in discipling our kids? I mean, the, 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 the distractions are plentiful, aren't they? Whether it's TV or whether it's uh, things we can do or, or whether it's career or whatever it is, there are so many distractions which can pull us away to our primary responsibility and that is making sure that the next generation is not wicked, that they do not fall away. We see some pretty powerful stuff in this passage, stuff which really challenges. We see culture wars. The culture wars that the people of God faced in Jacob's time. What do we see in this passage? We see Jacob and his family facing the danger of the Hivites who want to assimilate them. We also see the danger of complete destruction of the people in the land ganging up on them and wiping them out. We also see the inherent danger which can come from within, which is the temptation towards idolatry. And then we see Another ever-present danger, which is the loss of God's culture in the next generation. This is a constant danger. And to bring this all together, summarize it like this. The culture wars, they're not just about 
a battle between the evangelical right in politics and, and the libertine left, although that is one battle. The culture wars are much bigger than that. See, every day is a battle between whether we are God's people or the world's people, whether we enact God's culture or the world's culture. Now, some of you might have seen my picture up on the screen and thought, what does that picture have to do with the title? It, it doesn't make sense. So if you thought about it, you're like, why is that picture there? Well, who is that? Some of you in the room might know, but that is Justinian the Great, who was one of the greatest Christian empire emperors of the Roman Empire, uh, the, the eastern side of the empire, what we call today Byzantium, but they just called themselves Romans. And what was his capital? What was the capital of the Roman Empire at this stage? Do you remember what the name of the capital of the Byzantine Empire was? Constantinople, the city of Constantine, who was the first emperor to convert to Christianity. In other words, this great Christian leader who brought many reforms and, and many of the laws which we follow in the world today were influenced by guys like Justinian in, in the Roman Empire. He ruled in Constantinople, which was the most prominent and powerful and influential and significant Christian city in the world. What's the name of Constantinople today? Istanbul, which is the, the Arabs call it Istanbul because that is a, that's how they pronounce Constantinople. You barely find a church in Istanbul today. And Justinian is a reminder to me that it can be lost. And it can be lost so thoroughly that it's almost as if the church was never in Constantinople. Now you've got to remember, this was the most powerful Christian city for generations. And now you will barely find the presence of churches in that city. I think it's estimated to maybe be about a few thousand Christians, if that. The culture wars and not just between the political left and right, the culture wars are an ever-present battle which have gone on throughout history. And we have to do our part in making sure that God's will is enacted in our generation so that the next generation knows that they have their role to carry it on to the generation after that. So that it's not lost. So that Brisbane does not become like Constantinople. Assimilation is a constant temptation. Destruction is a constant local threat, not global. The church will never be destroyed globally, but locally there are places where it's gone extinct. Idolatry is the means through which the devil seeks to tempt us and, and lead us astray. And our children need to be guided in the faith intentionally, otherwise the next generation can be lost. We are in a constant war. A war against sin, against the devil, and against his evil. And every day we need to recognize this. God placed us here to enact his will. To represent him. How can we do that better? I'm going to leave you with that question. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for Jacob. We thank you for what we can learn from his life. Lord, help us to never forget that we are at war in this world against the kingdom of darkness, that we are your representatives. We are sent out into this world to represent you and to enact your kingdom in our lives. We just pray in Jesus' name that you would give us wisdom in how to do that, you would give us boldness in how to do that, and you would help us to never forget that our primary responsibility on this earth is to be your representatives and to see people brought into your kingdom and the kingdom passed on to the next generation. Help us to structure our lives around that priority instead of the things that we get distracted by. In Jesus' name, amen.